to this episode of Steph Talks Trash. My name is Stephanie Valentic, Editorial Director of Waste 360, and today I'll be speaking with Zach Lawless, the founder of Good Goods in New York. Good Goods is a brand new company that is bringing the concept of reuse to the wine industry. So today we'll be talking about what it takes to bring a glass bottle to consumers and the incentives that are being used to bring it back and reuse that product. Enjoy the show. Um, it, it's really nice to have you here um, to talk about good goods because, you know, the concept of reuse, bottle standardization, and consumer behavior are three really important topics, and you're kind of tackling them in a really unique way. So can you kind of start by telling me how this came about? I, I you know, spoke a little bit with you before about, you know, that you started with the single-use food takeout yeah. business, and then how, how did it kind of evolve from there? Yeah, definitely. So yeah, from the high level, what Good Goods does is we create um, an industry specific solution that allow for, for reuse that allows companies to, um, or anyone within the market to participate in a, a circular um, process. And so uh, the background for this is that in 2018, my partners and I actually started a company called Fresh Bowl, where we were doing uh, grab and go meals out of reusable containers in New York City. And so we launched this right about the same time that China had stopped accepting plastics. And so it was really on a whim that we decided to, uh, to do everything in reusable containers, knowing that we wanted to be more of a, pro uh, a, a part of the solution than um, a part of the problem. And so what was great is the food did really well. We, we, we grew, into, grew into New York City, we're doing really well up to COVID, but what we really learned was consumer behavior and the difficulties around uh, around reuse. So we were remarkably getting 80% of our products back across our platform. Um, so that's whether it was in a subway, in a college library, in an office building lobby, or in the actual office building itself. And that was um, a long process of fine tuning kind of consumer experience, consumer messaging, in order to get those uh, to get those numbers to where they are and playing with the incentive program. And so. When COVID hit, uh, we had always envisioned ourselves as kind of becoming a larger platform for reuse, but we took a step back and said, hey, uh, what is it that we want to achieve and, and how can we do it? So we knew uh, to focus in on this idea for, for reuse, we started looking at what industries are, are most suitable for this type of behavior. And we land on the wine and spirit space because a lot of the problems that we found within the food space around um, supply chains not being built out for durable, reusable packaging, um, for the cost of packaging being so much lower than the cost of reusable packaging. Um, we, we really focused on wine for kind of having those things already built into the industry as really the first segment to approach. How does the process work? If I were to buy a bottle of wine in New York City and I wanted to participate in this, what would I have to do? So it's pretty simple. You would just go into a wine store. You would see a bottle that has our markings on it. Um, most of the time, those bottles are actually on um, a specific shelf. So you can you can see everything that's kind of a part of the program together. You purchase that bottle. You bring it back. You actually scan the bottle back with your phone uh, and then just put it in a bin that the, the retailer set out for you. And we give you credit uh, back towards uh, towards purchasing your next item at the store. So what kind of challenges have you seen with from where you started and to bringing this up to uh, wine producers or and, and retail stores that want to participate in this program? So the great part has been that the participation for, for market players in, in this space has been great. I think that when you're, especially when you're talking about an agricultural product like, like wine, um, the people who are producing it tend to really care about the environment, tend to really care about the impact that their products are having. So it's been a really refreshing uh, refreshing change of pace from talking to manufacturers of food to manufacturers of, uh, of the um, wine itself um, about how much more mission aligned we are. So it, it really comes down to, can we do it in a cost effective manner? Can we do it in a way that's easy and simple for them? Um, so that's really like two parts of our approach. One is that we want to make sure we create industry, industry specific approaches so that a wine, a winemaker who wants to participate doesn't have to go through any extra steps. We've got everything figured out for them. The second part of that is actually to make sure that we have everything standardized so we can do it in a cost efficient uh, manner for them as well, too. So we're not adding costs to their bottom line or anything like that. 
you know, where, do, where does the competitiveness come in if they were to use your, uh, your program? So from a producer standpoint, there's 125,000 labels that are approved by the TTB every year. Mm -hmm. And I think that everybody's seen that there's a growing demand for sustainable products. Um, and so what this really does is it allows them to stand out from kind of the, the noise of the other labels that are being produced. And then on the back end, when those customers are getting credits for coming back into the store, uh, it's bringing them back to repurchasing the, purchasing their products. We're seeing a really high repurchase for uh, repurchase rates for customers that are coming through the program. And it's also giving retailers something that's different to talk about than maybe just the wines themselves to actually push customers there. So not only from a front end sales, but from a repeat sales, we're seeing that it's actually really helping differentiate the, the people on our platform. You keep bringing up the topic of uh, standardization. Uh, what does that mean for you know the, the wine bottles and the industry? Yeah, I think that one of the one of the really interesting things that drove us to wine is that from an outside perspective, it looks fairly standardized. You go into a wine store, most of the bottles are in a similar shape. Um, but once you start to dive into it, you realize that people are buying them from different manufacturers, tiny changes in like the, the diameter of the, the bottle uh, neck change the whole filling process. So from an operation standpoint, it's very far from standardized. But the appearance of it actually really helps us in that it doesn't, we don't have to really convince people of changing from a dramatically different type of packaging into what we're doing. But we really do believe that the solution to circularity in a supply chain hinges on this idea of standardization, at least in a, in a form that allows everybody to be able to participate. Because um, it's key that when, if, if things are standardized, and I can wash a bottle and get it to a different supplier and I'm not getting everything back to that same point, that's when costs really get efficient enough that you can beat the cost of single use plastics. One of the great things that happened for us when we were doing Fresh Bowl is that with that return rate, our cost of packaging was lower than single use plastics. And so what we really want to do is make that, that same type of uh, experience capable for everybody else who's, who's joining along. Um, so let's kind of shift a little bit and talk um, about the consumer behavior you've seen um, from starting Good Goods. What have you seen, you know, once you started the program and how has it kind of progressed from there? Because as you mentioned, you know, a lot of people, a lot of consumers are, you know, they're asking producers to come up with solutions. Yeah, I think that you're talking about a new frontier of consumer behavior. Like if you talk about pricing strategy, there's so many people who you can, you can reach out to who talk to you about if, if you price your products at certain points certain type of behavior will happen. But as far as return go, returns go, it is um, a completely new experience and a new, a new experience that needs to be thought out by the brands. It, it's a, diff, a secondary interaction with those, uh, with those products. And so we have started to jump into kind of how, can, how, do, how do we think about it and how does that actually help improve return rates? We've had all sorts of really interesting learnings. Um, one of the really interesting ones is, is even framing um, any additional costs or incentives as a deposit creates a negative consumer experience, whereas just framing it as a reward increases your return rates, but also increases your consumer satisfaction. So being able to twist the idea from being um, a cumbersome and time consuming issue to being a rewarding and fun uh, a value product for your, your pro or value for your products is, is really important to the consumer behavior. What kind of opportunities does this provide um, in, in incentivizing a, a type of reuse program like this? I think that uh, the opportunities in this are in, in the early stages, at least definitely to stand out, to reach this, to reach these consumers who really do care about it. Um, and then in the secondary stage, it is to, um, it is to build loyalty for your program, your products. So um, basically, like I said, we're beating the cost of packaging um, for single use, we're creating incentives for bringing people back. Now, how do you target those incentives to get people to uh, purchase more often? How do you message towards your products? And then the really interesting one that we're excited about is this idea of connecting directly with your consumer. So reuse creates a, an interesting, uh, interesting behavior and in that every time somebody brings something back and wants to store credit or, or receive credit, they do so through uh, a unique identifier, which is in this case, their cell phone number. So what it allows us to do is understand more about who are purchasing these products and to help brands create programs that 
are more tailored towards towards these specific customers. So while the packaging might be more standardized, the experience is actually more personalized. And I think that's really key to what we're doing. So uh, can you please tell me about the, you know, the number of bottles that have been reused to this point and also the environmental benefits that are, you know, are, are coming about from re the reuse process? Yeah, definitely. So we're in the we're in the testing phase of this program. We're going live with it in May with the first like real suppliers who are on board with the program reusing their bottles. But um, from a consumer experience standpoint, we've been in the stores testing this program for um, almost uh, almost six months now. And it's really encouraging. So we only have 10 stores that we're, we're testing out in New York. Uh, we have 4,000 active users between those 10 stores. Uh, we've received over 20,000 bottles back. So uh, the response has been incredible. The participation from not only the retailers, but the customers has kind of exceeded what we've expected. And um, with consumers who've signed up for the program, we're getting 80% of packaging back. So we're seeing the exact same behavior happen in wine as we saw in fresh food, which mm -hmm. interestingly enough is the exact, almost the exact same numbers you see when you talk about the reusable milk programs in the grocery stores. So we full heartedly believe that there's an undervalued, um, uh, undervalued consumer experience that, that's probably due to how difficult it is to actually enable reuse. So where, where do you, uh, what direction do, do you hope that Good Goods goes? Uh, do, do you hope to, you know, expand this nationally? Um, do you hope to work with wine producers across the country and bottlers and, and kind of finding these solutions for other industries? Yeah, our goal is we're, we're fully focused on the wine industry to start. Like I said, we're, we're really trying to take an industry specific approach to make it easy for everyone who wants to jump on. Um, we see hopefully this expanding throughout the country, becoming a significant segment of the wine industry. Um, and from there, we'll start to tackle other industries as well, too, and, uh, and try to create this option for, for anybody who's starting a new product and, and wants to do it in, in, in a reusable way. So I do have one final question. How is your uh, personal relationship with waste and your understanding of how, you know, recycling, reuse, you know, in the reuse process, how's that changed uh, throughout your experience uh, throughout this pandemic uh, with Fresh Bowl and then, you know, with creating this business? Yeah, I mean, I think like everyone else uh, with in how the economy set up, I struggle to make to do uh, the right things at all the right times as well, too. And I find myself having kind of being a little bit anxious about some of the decisions I do sometimes as well. But um, I think that there's a large percentage of that, a large percentage of of consumer behavior that's really, really should be owned by the the brands that are producing. It's really hard. It's very difficult as a consumer to live a sustainable and uh, lifestyle, especially if you're trying to do a zero waste lifestyle. And I think the pandemic has really accentuated that even further. I mean, in New York, uh, most of the restaurants where you used to go sit down at, you can still sit down, but now they're serving you everything in plastics. And so the the uh, I think there was initially a big step back in kind of the sustainability movement. I mean, the plastic bag industry was really pushing to have plastic bags come back. And, um, and so it was interesting and kind of scary at first to see that transition happening. But I think mm -hmm. that it's really, it's really pushed the other direction out. People have, people saw the additional waste that was coming from all these new, these new things and they, uh, it resonated with them. And now they're, they're pushing more towards the other direction. And I think, um, from media, from individual people I've talked to that the, it was a step back, but it's now two steps forward. And I think that 2021, you're going to see a lot of changes, um, not just from a regulatory perspective, but also from the, the producers and the, the makers of the different products and, and how they're handling the, the packaging and packaging and things of that nature. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. It was really awesome to talk to you. Um, I look forward to launch in May and seeing where that goes. It sounds like it's going to be, you know, very interesting, not only, you know, a business model, but, you know, a case study to see, you know, where consumers and producers come together to um, help the uh, re help find recycling and reuse solutions within our country. Thank you once again for joining me for this episode of Steph Talks Trash. For this and other episodes, please visit Waste360.com.